Hi guys. Uh, so I welcome all of you to this third session of sociology current affairs. Hi Arushi, Srishti, Vidushi. Uh, so you guys are here for the first time. All, all first timers. Okay, great, great. Okay, sure. And have you seen the recordings? Uh, like the other two sessions uh, are up on YouTube. Have you seen those? Okay, great, great. <laughs> So, uh, Vidushi, you have a basic idea, like what is this session all about? So, uh, uh, for others who have not seen and are here for the first time, so this is like uh, we discuss current affairs, things that are in news, not exactly in the last one month, but we also go beyond that. Because sociology, you there are specific issues that are important from a sociological perspective so you cannot say you cannot restrict yourself to just one month so uh yes yes we'll be having these sessions we'll be having these sessions and we'll cover uh, current affairs till means 2022 so i am basically covering entire i'm, I'm mostly going back to 2021 all things that are important that that were in news in 2021 because if you uh i'll, I'll address that question arushi uh see uh because uh, if you see this year's paper it's not that it's restricted to only last few months or last one year current affairs if something if an issue was is important then uh, it remains important for two to three years because from a you know a, a social issue or something uh, it, it it becomes relevant people talk about it 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 remains in the news for quite some time so uh, we'll the going by that we will uh, we'll cover at least two years current affairs and uh, apart from that uh, we'll uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to cover all important themes. For example, caste is a very important thing. You have caste in politics. You have education as a very important thing. Gender, uh, you know, then you have population, uh, demography. Then you have um, other themes like health, uh, poverty and inequality. So mostly your paper two section B is very, very dynamic, child labor. So I'll pick up important articles uh, from sources like your uh, Hindu Indian Express, your uh, EPW, we'll cover a lot of EPW because it uh, covers lots of good research, uh, Yojana Kurukshetra if required, and uh, we'll go about like that. Arushi, uh, there is nothing called the best optional or, you know, the not so good optional in UPSC. If you have grip, if you have interest, you should pick up a subject of your interest. If you have interest in uh, sociology, then uh, I would say that, yes, the syllabus is pretty short. And if you cover sociology, it will uh, also help you in your essay and your Indian society part of GS1. So that way, it's really beneficial. You cannot say something like based on what par parameters you're seeing best, I don't know. So there's I don't think there is anything called best or, you know, not so good in UPSC. Uh, we'll start, we'll wait for a couple of minutes to, for other people to join in and then uh, we'll start. Uh, I, I will, uh, are you guys first timers? Like you'll be attending, 2022 will be your first attempt? Vidushi, okay, okay. Syllabus in short. Syllabus is mostly about, uh, you know, in paper one, you have your, um, you have thinkers, different theories of sociology and paper two is entirely Indian sociology. Your section A will cover th theories of different Indian thinkers and section B of paper two is mostly your, you know, current issues related to your Indian, uh, uh, Indian society. And uh, there you have to write from a sociological angle. There will be topics that are overlapping with your GS2 and GS3, but you have to write from a sociological angle. That is the thing.
okay great so i will quickly share my screen so basically here we discuss current affairs as i have said so uh, again one thing that i want to be very clear we are not discussing theories here okay so if any theory is related to it i will give a brief background but this is since this is a current affairs class i will not dis be discussing uh, sociological theories elaborately out here assuming that you will do it uh, you have done it you have gone through it or you will go through it so these will actually add as value addition so once you start writing answers you will see that these current affairs will come will come help when you're writing especially when you're addressing the section b part of your paper too also in other questions as examples as uh, you know and where you can use them as examples as data facts uh there you can uh, use it okay so now i will start the thing i'll quickly share my screen so the first news that we have is just a second i'll so this is the session 3 of our sociology current affairs so for those who are new uh, what the course covers i'll uh, it's there last one month but it obviously goes beyond one month interlinking with your previous year questions and static areas before that is my screen visible to everybody is my screen visible okay great great so first thing that first news that we have is uh you know incident of caste discrimination so there has been an incident in uh, incident in uh, uttarakhand where a person uh, a lady she was from the lower class she was a dalit so she has um, she was appointed as a cook in the mid day meal uh, scheme that runs in schools but there were widespread protests from uh, upper class uh, upper caste students and their family that they don't want to take you know that the midday meal school the, in the midday meal scheme students are provided uh, cooked lunch uh, from school uh, you know uh, so that you know it, it's it's an angle so that they there uh, are their health uh, you know nutrition parameters all these are addressed and uh, you know we have better educational outcomes so there was a problem that uh, she had to be removed uh, that uh, from her service because uh, these upper caste people they uh, their families and the students themselves protested that they don't want to take food cooked from a dalit uh, woman so uh, so how it is relevant from a sociological context it is like you can quote it directly as an example where you can quote if you if you have read if anyone has read paper 2 you have uh, i'm sure you've come across louis dumo uh, so he tried to describe caste from a cultural perspective he said that caste is not is not, it's not economic it's not based on uh, division of labor it's based on values and certain ideals so he gave a cultural interpretation to the institution of caste and it is and the very essence of caste is pollution and purity so uh, anything that an upper caste that is related to an upper caste is pure and anything that is related to a lower caste is impure so that is why the food cooked by a uh, uh, by a woman who belongs to a lower ca lower caste uh, is considered impure so uh, in this context you can use it as an example uh, in explaining louis dumo's concept of pollution and purity so if you see that our our culture our uh, you know the ideals the values that we have in the indian society uh, it divides in the hindu social order that is uh, it divides the entire social space into two things one is pure and one is impure so uh, you know anything that is concerned with uh, you know the the puja the puja ghar or anything related to uh, any religious activity that is considered pure on the contrary um, you know anything that is uh, 
you know, you know, the food that we eat, the remnants of the food that we eat, that we have, like after you've finished your lunch or your dinner, whatever is left on the plate, we keep it aside or we keep it in a sink or a basin or whatever. And nowadays in modern, uh, when we have these apartments and all, we don't have that much, you know, we don't follow so much of uh, rigid uh, rules, but, uh, you know, previously it used to be, there used to be a courtyard or a place if if someone has house in villages, you will see in villages, there used to be a place where, uh, you know, these after your leftover food or the food, the plates that you have eaten food from. Uh, after eating, it used to be kept somewhere which is outside the main house because it is considered impure. So this domain of pure, this binary domain of pure and impure, it's there, it's, it's very much there in our social order. So this not only co co you know covers material things. For example, as I gave the example of food, or you know you have these bodily wastes. Uh, for example, we all we have hair on our head. We have these nails. But the moment you are uh, you know uh, cutting your hair, we are told that whenever you come from uh, after your the person comes, the barber comes to the house, or you go to a salon and cut your hair you have you come home and take a bath because you what you know uh, these are body these are considered bodily wastes that you're getting rid of so that is why you are in a state of impurity and uh, you have to in order to make yourself pure you have to take a bath even nails when you know someone dies in the family i uh, you have to like after you have you know uh, visiting the shamshan and you coming back home you have to take a bath and you have to get rid of your, uh, you know, nails and hair. Um, so, uh, because, you know, again, death is considered impure. Birth is considered pure. So, that is how we divide our entire domain into pure and impure. So, similarly, even a, a upper caste, anything that is concerning a Brahmin is considered poor, uh, sorry, pure. And anything that can, that is related to a Dalit, that's why, you know, in uh, in ancient villages, even Adri Bete in his study, he speaks of, you know, these lower caste people who are the untouchables who live uh, in the peripheries of the villages. And the Brahmin should not even, you know, uh, walk through. The Dalit should never come into the main center area of the village. They will live in the periphery. And if they come, they have to come they have to give a, you know, a kind of a message or a signal that, okay, I am coming to take water from them. They have separate water uh, places to take water. Or if they walk into the main village, they have to come with, they have to give a message or maybe they make a sound or something that I am coming. Everyone will move away because a Brahmin is not supposed to stand on the shadow of a Dalit because if he does, then uh, he becomes impure. So Louis Dumo basically um, tries to, uh, classify, uh, you know, uh, define caste as a cultural institution, which is which has its base in values and beliefs. So this is entirely a belief based system. So uh, that is why this this thing is uh, it's still there. Caste is in, as as a culture, and he says that it is based on the concept of you know uh, on homo hierarchies. So what is homo hierarchy? It's it's based on a kind of hierarchy. That the higher you are in the hierarchy, for example, a Brahmin, he is the highest person in the hierarchy. Uh, you are pure. As you move down, you have the twice born castes or the dvijas, that is the Brahmin and the Kshatriyas, who are considered twice born. Why twice born? Because you, uh, you know, you have the sacred thread ceremony. So all those who wear the sacred thread, they are uh, considered the uh, twice born and they are pure. Then you have the Vaishyas, then you have the Shudras, then you have the Mahashudras. So as you come down the hierarchy, that is why you, your, uh, you know, your, uh, it, it slowly from purity, it comes down, it becomes impure. And uh, that is why Louis Dumo says that since it's a cultural concept, caste is here to stay. So no matter how much, uh, whatever progress, whatever modernization happens, uh, since the society is based on this concept of hierarchy, homo hierarchies, contrary to Western society, which is based on homo equalis, that is in Western societies, everyone is considered equal. It's 
we don't have a, a, a kind of system yes we have classes but that is based on economic uh you know what is your economic power how much money you earn how much power you hold but it is not based on on some on your on your birth so that is why caste is a cultural concept it is ingrained in india's values and uh, ideas and that is why you caste is here to stay and when you are explaining this concept of louis dumo you have to uh give it substantiated with such examples that since it's a cultural concept that is why even uh the post when the post of uh when someone is taken for the post of uh say for the job of a midday meal cook so she the uh, there would be certain criteria maybe there has been some advertisement or something that whether she can cook well or whatever other maybe she has some qualification of you know uh being uh educated till the level of uh eighth standard or something like that now that is universal that is based on that is uh that 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 has got nothing to do with caste so that is we are having modern institutions in our society now uh our society is no longer ascriptive ascriptive is means that whatever you get by birth for example caste caste is a ascriptive uh institution uh it is achievement oriented so we have whatever anyone who fits the post who is who who fulfills those criteria like you are educated till the eighth standard you are a woman of a certain age then no matter whatever your background is whatever your religion whatever your caste is you are fit for the job and you're selected for the job but just because caste is become caste system is so very ingrained in our value system in our ideals people are opposing uh, the food cooked by this woman and that is why uh, it we we can actually substantiate louis dumo's uh, statement that caste is here to stay caste is not here to go because it is a cultural concept in indian society it is not based on economic or something it is a cultural concept so he says that caste is based on uh is present in the consciousness so despite being uh, despite being modern or despite having modernity that is we are having democratic uh, you know uh, you have your fundamental rights which says equality of opportunity for all so values are holding us back uh and louis dumo says that pollution is contagious but purity is non transferable which means that if you are a brahmin you are pure a brahmin touching a shudra doesn't mean that uh that the shudra becomes pure on the contrary if the shudra touches a brahmin then he passes on his pollution to the brahmin and that is why uh, these people think that uh if they take the food cooked by a dalit woman the pollution will be transmitted on to them and that is why uh, they deny the food now coming to uh yeah yeah sure arushi yes yes arushi yes ma'am ma'am in today's newspaper chakmas and hujans is also related to the sociology so current affairs yes yes chakmas and hujans are different ethnic groups Uh, these are the tribal groups that are uh, uh, disseparated from the arunachal uh, pradesh yes that is a news uh, that has been there because there is a rise rising separatist tendency and so on okay ma'am thank you yeah so you can use these as examples we have not covered the, that news but we'll be covering in the next session yes ma'am that's why i am uh, telling you that bothering me a lot w what is bothering you mam this example like that i can put in this uh... yes 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 absolutely when okay. you are talking of regionalism or rise of eth ethnic uh, you know ethnic violence as i said in this session in these sessions we'll go you know theme wise so when we take up the theme of ethnic violence we'll cover all of that so when we are uh, when you are give, writing an answer on ethnocentric uh, uh, nationalism or you know ethnic violence then you can give these examples okay ma'am thank you so uh, how can you use it 
in your previous year questions. See, this is a previous year question. First, you can use it when you're writing any question on Louis Dumont's perspective on caste, on his homo hierarchies. You can use this example. Second, see, how has caste hindered democracy? This is a previous year question. Not a recent one, but uh, it came in one of the years, post-2000. I don't exactly remember the year. So here you can say that, see, when the post of, when the job of a midday meal cook is opened, it is open to all. So uh, there you have your fundamental rights, right to equality of opportunity. But just because we have culture as a, sorry, caste as a cultural institution, it is so very ingrained in our system that we cannot, uh, you know, get rid of it. And that is how it is hampering the smooth functioning of democracy. It is hampering uh, our, uh, you know, our democratic institutions. It is hampering, uh, you know, our fundamental rights, the, the rights that are entailed in our constitution. Next, Louis Dumont's notion of pollution and purity. Next, another question you have, is caste system weakening in India? So in order to say, Louis Dumont said that caste will not weaken in India. Uh, see, when you write these kind of questions, though this is not a session on, the uh, on theory, but I'll still tell you, with caste system weakening in India, when you're writing such kind of questions, you have to give both the sides. You can give, you can argue that it is weakening because you have dominant, dominant caste, you know, through process of Sanskritization that Emin Srinivasan speaks of through processes of modernization, like westernization, dominant caste, people who are becoming dominant, not because of they belong to a higher caste, but because they have, uh, uh, you know, they have control over land or they are becoming educated. For example, uh, these, uh, you had these, uh, uh, these people, these movements, you know, by these Patidars or, you know, the Kapus and Reddies of Andhra Pradesh, or you have these Patils of uh, Gujarat, they were fighting for reservation. So these, uh, they are not upper caste, they are not also lower caste, but since they have control over large amount of land, they are becoming the dominant caste and they are demanding reservation or having other political demands. So actually caste system that way, so just like you are born a Brahmin, you have lots of facilities. That way, you know, uh, the demo, thanks to democracy, democratic institutions, thanks to modernization and other forces, land reforms, whatever, that we have these institutions which are weakening. On the contrary, caste is a cultural uh, institution is not weakening. That is why we have incidents like this. Is it clear? So how you can use this current affairs? Uh, I was getting a few queries like how you can use the current affairs. So uh, now is it clear how you can use the current affairs? Any doubts, anybody? Can we quote articles also in first question as intro? Like although article 15 provides equality, but as per... As per uh, Louis Dumont, caste being a, is here to stay. Uh, this, in the introduction, if you say as per Louis Dumont, it is here to stay, then that in one, in, in one paragraph, you are completing the, your entire answer. I would say that, uh, though this is not a session on answer writing, but I would suggest that you can start with article 15, then you can build your, uh, you know, build your answer. You have to build your answer. You have to say article 15 provides that uh, you have equality of opportunity. However, there are va ample variations or, you know, there, there are ample violations or ample incidences, which, you know, refutes these democratic principles. See, is caste, um, uh, uh, what was the first question? Uh, how has caste, uh, just a second, how has caste hindered uh, democracy? So you have to build up, then you speak of these examples. See, you have to keep your best things for the body of the answer. Then one, two, three, four, you give the arguments. And then you say that caste as a cultural institution is hindering democracy to some extent. You have to add other angles also that there is caste-based politics. That's why these, uh, these uh, political parties, they have to give uh, caste-based reservations and all these things, you know, caste-based politics, politicization of caste, you have to write about Rajni Kothari and all these things. And then you have to, uh, to conclude. Is it clear? Who asked this, this question? Vidushi. Yeah. Is it clear now, Vidushi?
Okay, great. So we'll move on. Uh, next is, this is a very recurrent theme. You can have a question because now for the last two, three years, COVID is in news and you are having a lot of, uh, you know, um, debates and stuff on online education. So from a sociological angle, how you would think on online in your GS also. And there you will say that uh, yes, people are um, not having access to uh, resources, online resources, there's a digital divide. You will write these points in sociology also, but you have to go beyond that when you are addressing. So often people have doubt. Yes. Yes, you can unmute yourself and ask. Yes, ma'am. As a uh, as a uh, SC and STs are deprived from the society, though they make uh, an entrepreneurship uh, very best at their level. So, uh, as a uh, as we can put this example on that uh, previous question. In what context, ma'am? As the caste. I I I do not get your uh, thing. Uh, as caste, what? As as. As the previous how question. caste system as how caste system is uh, you know kind of uh, diluting yes, as uh, as SC and STs are deprived sections of the society though we do not take uh, uh, though they take uh, the, at very level best to entrepreneurship. See, just a statement will not do. You have to substantiate it with data or example or some study. Okay, ma'am. If you say that they are doing their best, it that's a very qualitative statement. How can you say a qualitative statement? Uh, on what angle they are doing best? You have you can write about schemes. Data, data you can release. write about startup India, stand up India, all these schemes, specific schemes for SEs, STs. You know uh, that the government is trying to you know uplift them, uplift. empower them, and through these these things, they are the caste system is diluting. But caste as a cultural thing is staying back in some areas. That's why we have so many honor killings and dal killing of Dalits and all these things. Clear? Okay. Uh, next, you have problems on online education. Uh, so as I was saying that... Uh, it actually, uh, so you have to think beyond. So we'll see how you can build up on such kind of answers. So according to, so this is data, you can start or you can use it in your, uh, you can start with directly with such data. It's good data. It's the NSSO data. Or you can, um, you know, you can just uh, use it in, the, in your, uh, in one to substantiate your points. So as per the NSSO, uh, only 9% of students are currently enrolled in any course have access to infrastructure. So this is according to NSSO 2017-18. Also, the, uh, it, uh, there is another data which says that only 2% students from the poorest income group have access to computer with internet, 3% have access to computer at home, and 10% have access to internet through any of the digital devices. So when you have such kind of multiple things and you have to uh, you know, remembering so many things are difficult. You can see that less than 10% or approximately 10% have proper access to digital uh, services. You can uh, integrate the entire uh, thing, picture into one, uh, you know, entire scenario into one and you can write. And only 21%, so there is also a gender divide that only 21% of women in India According to the Global System for Mobile Communications Associations, uh, mobile gender gap report, only 21% women have uh, you know, access to mobile, while 42% men have internet access. So you see 50% men you know, have access to mobile, but uh, in case of women, that is less than one. Th writing of the problems of uh, you know, online education,
says that the double whammy of low access and deep digital divide it will exclude a majority of students from actively participating and benefiting from online education uh, you can actually write that uh, you can quote such such kind of uh, statements that there's a double whammy of low access and deep digital divide name is not so important unless he is someone very significant it's just one of those studies so you can say that double whammy of low access first you have low and also there's a deep digital divide because as i said that women are facing the double jeopardy because there uh, certain people have and certain people don't have so this is where uh, your sociological angle comes you can use these data the fifth point is very specific it says that there is you know education has become a commodity according to this research by uh, you know this paper by mac cohen he says that there is a commodification of education and there is an unbundling effect so what is unbundling for example uh, you know it has become like a commodity you go to a you know you go to a shop or you go to a departmental store and you can pick up an object and you pay for it and it's done but when a person is visiting the university you are getting the physical space you are making friends you are you know uh, being politically aware imagine when when we were in school we do we had no idea of politics most of us did not have then we went into college and then you got to know so many things about you are being politically aware you are being socially aware um you are making friends you are socializing you are learning so many things but when you are uh uh in online mode you don't have all of that so there is unbundling you can quote this there is commodification and unbundling for example you go and subscribe to a course for example now you are you are uh, watching this so you just know about socio current affairs of sociology so you as if you are you just subscribe to the course though this is free whatever but you subscribe to this course and you are uh, uh, catering to this that is so that is a commodification of education but this is a different thing but when you are doing it for school and college level you have these you know online um, open platforms massive online open courses for example even foreign universities like cambridge and harvard these days are offering these online courses so you can just go and buy some course and you can subscribe and you can be uh, have a course in say in economics you can purchase another course in history then you can also purchase something but this interdisciplinary space or you know this total uh, you know building of your personality that is not happening so that is what is saying that there is a commodification and unbundling of education okay yes according to mahashweta bhattacharya she says that the problem is the virtual des uh, nowadays we are having virtual digital space as compared to the physical space of a university now how you are going to uh, use it in your answers is we all know about so this challenge is the functionalist approach now those who have studied sociology paper 1 you know that uh, there is an approach called functionalist approach and which tries to see the function that each social institution serves in the in a social setup and durkheim started this functionalist approach and parsons was another you know uh, one one of the proponents of this functionalist approach so parsons uh, he was an american sociologist he said that school represents society when you are born in a family so you are uh, it's it's very ascriptive ascriptive means you are born in a family you are uh, say you are born to the ambanis or you are born to uh, whatever a middle class urban family a rural uh, or to a tenant uh, uh, to a uh, tenant farmer or something so you would grow up in that setup because, and you have nothing to do about it your whatever uh, is given to you whatever uh, setup you are growing up you you are not to be blamed you whether you will be born to the ambanis or whether you will be born in a lower middle class family is, is not in your hands but school is a it's it's not based on ascription school is based on meritocracy or achievement based so that acts as a leveler so it acts as a universal platform where people get a you know a 
a hunch of society you have students from different uh, uh, you have students from different backgrounds who are coming and you have to interact with them so it develops as a social space so this is another uh, you know when you are studying your manifest and latent functions you can give this example that that manifest function of school is education but the latent function is that it also acts as a you know as a leveler or as a you know as in promoting social solidarity for example in a society we all live together in harmony uh, uh, like that's the basic objective that we all try to live in harmony so in school also it acts like that for social solidarity that uh, uh, you know uh, a crorepati's son and you know the son of a you know a a, a, a simple say a vendor a street vendor they sit on the same bench they share the same food but due to the online education system this is being challenged we are not having that so someone who is this is actually deepening so the functionalist view uh, view of education that education acts as schools act as you know education institutions they act as means of promoting social solidarity that is being challenged because and that because someone who has an uh, has a macbook has a high speed internet connection is has money who can buy courses from harvard is going and getting courses online courses from there and someone who is living in a remote area say somewhere in the northeast or in jammu and kashmir where internet can or in some villages where internet is poor you don't have wifi you have to depend on mobile net only tower is very poor so you don't have access to it so it is actually commodification someone who has money can go and buy from uh, you know a, a a shopping mall from some good designer brand and someone who doesn't have money will not uh, cannot go he has to you know go to a cheap you know a store on the pavement so that is how education instead of being a leveler education is becoming uh, commodified so uh, this you this angle you can add when you are talking of you know uh, online education problems of online education you can have it as a write a sociological analysis or sociological or you know impact of online education or you know challenges to online education you can add these points apart from that from a marxist perspective you can write that you know uh, this student leaders that are built on these uh, educational institutions you have uh, students they are the you know the young the bright minds of the country so they argue uh, or you know they debate and you know uh, and through this thesis and antithesis they challenge the system a new synthesis is formed that is the basic of basics of marxism which speaks of dialectics but this dialectics is being challenged because in a online setup maybe the teacher is teaching and uh, the student is sleeping or you know the student who has a question can't even ask because the internet connection is poor so uh, and then again you have the gender divide so in that way you are actually uh, you know it is actually uh, jeopardizing this you know this building of this uh, dialectics in the society so in this way you can so uh, you can address you know when you have questions like that that what are the problems of online education or right from a sociological perspective and you can add these lines like education uh, you know acts as uh, provides value consensus and social solidarity so the role of education the role of schools is value of of achievement and the value of equality of opportunity these are the two major roles of school they give you a sense of achievement no matter whatever your your if you are born to a very rich person you can have a sense you cannot have a sense of achievement because you have just got that uh, you know virasat mein mili hai that kind of a thing and if you are uh, born to a poor man then also it's not your fault you feel bad about it but that also you know there's no sense of achievement but when you go to school and you get good marks or something then that is a sense of achievement no matter whatever your background is and it also gives equal opportunity as i said but the, these two are challenged and then you can add the conflict perspective uh, that it challenges the dialectical the, the uh, challenges the dialectics so this is how you can address this question any doubts any doubts guys any 
any doubts no great arushi vidushi any doubts vijay vijay i think was there in the previous class as well isn't it yes ma'am yeah any doubts ma'am could you repeat the part of unbundling and commodification that part is little bit confusing unbundling and who was this this was kapil yes ma'am okay great see commodification of education means just like meaning of commodification and unbundling are linked yes uh unbundling commodification means you go to a store it's a commodity education has become a commodity uh you know because you go to a store you go and buy a commodity uh whatever you want you go you pay for that whatever is whatever your pocket suits you go and go for that but you know this this educational institution which which would act as a microcosm which would act as you know in uh, you not only get your uh, education you just it's it's not that you go and uh, you know uh, uh just attend classes and get your education and that it's not that you attend a class and you shut down your laptop it's not like that it's you interact with your seniors that builds solidarity you uh you know participate in political debates so that kind of creates your political awareness so this is it acts as a bundle a bundle of things but when you are having online education you just attend a class for example these school kids they just uh, they just log in there is why do we have an have an assembly in school so that you know it it teaches discipline that this is how you should start your day every day everybody in one you know standing in perfect uh, attention position wearing a, you know proper school dress and uh, you know because it promotes so solidarity that we are all one and there is some kind of discipline there is a set of rules and regulations so school is that place from where your set of schools and uh, rules and regulations you know that when you are in a society that is why parson says that school is you know a miniature version of the society that in a society when you are there you have to follow certain rules and regulations if all the cars stop at a red signal you also have to stop your car you just cannot you know uh, uh speed uh, break the signal and you can speed your car it's not possible uh then you will be caught so this is what this you get a bundle of things a bundle of values you get education you get a lot of things you you know about sharing you know a lot of things but when you are taking to online education there is unbundling you are just subscribing to a particular commodity that is say a class on history you attend it you shut down your laptop and it's over so it's like a commodity so on one hand there is commodification and there is unbundling so these two are linked is it clear now yes ma'am it is very much clear thank you thank you so much okay great okay how can i attend your next class uh um, we have these current affairs sessions but now we'll also be having some basic uh, you know uh, sociology foundation lectures you know on your basic for starting from scratch for those who are just starting with sociology we'll have certain free lectures in uh, on youtube we'll be starting it soon we'll be giving you the link you can attend live classes and then we'll have it on youtube i think live classes gives you the best experience because you can you know address your doubts you can uh, ask your doubts and then we'll have current affairs also so we'll have a combination of both every month uh your basics and your current affairs okay 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 preeti today is my first class okay so are you liking it we we post the link on your telegram channels so through there you can get the link okay great okay so moving on
so how you can use it in your in your previous year see though this is a very current topic uh, um, you know online education just a second guys just a second just a second Yes, we'll be starting it soon. We haven't started it. We'll be starting it soon. And uh, you will get you'll get all the necessary information on Telegram. Okay. So uh, so how you can link with your previous year questions? So the, though this is a very new topic due to your COVID, there was a question in 2000. Where educational inequalities in India, you can have the same theme repeated with the COVID dimension. So there you can write that this kind of digital divide is a new kind of inequality that we are ha having because you are, uh, you know, you are uh, so heavily reliant on digital mode of education. Second, unequal access to education. This was another previous year question. This this came back in nineties, but you can actually have it. You can actually have this question now as well. So these two questions. Next, we will move on to the, uh, you know, the ART bill. Though this is not a new thing. Uh, it came uh, two, three months back. I think this was a news. But uh, you have this ART uh, bill. You have this fresh bill that was uh, there in, uh, uh, that has been laid in the Rajya Sabha which says that only, you know, married couples, they can, uh, you know, uh, have uh, children through surrogacy. You, I hope all of you are aware of the concept of surrogacy. When a, ch a couple cannot have children, they take to, uh, you know, um, another woman uh, will, uh, uh, will, will uh, give, will uh, carry the baby in her womb. So uh, this was this bill first came up in 2013 because, uh, you know, India is a market for commercial surrogacy. Now it has been banned. We have only altruistic surrogacy. Now altruistic means that if someone in your family, not for, uh, you know, not for uh, against money is ready to bear your child in her womb. And that also there are several conditions that have been imposed that the woman is a, uh, you know, has to be married. Uh, she has to be of a certain age. And she has to have children of her own and you cannot have, you know, one more than one or two surrogacies. I think only one or maybe two maximum in your lifetime. Because India at a point of time was becoming a huge market for, for, sur uh, for commercial surrogacy. The childless couples, you know, uh, uh, they would come from foreign countries and they would uh, you know uh, look for surrogate mothers at and you know we are uh, um, we are a very populous country we are second in terms of population and uh, people are poor so if you just give them 40 50000 rupees they are ready to carry the child in their womb but when when a woman carries a child in her womb that actually causes a lot of you know it is uh, mm, her, her uh, health goes through a lot of, she has nutritional deficiencies and all these things. Uh, so these couples, they, they talk of taking care of the woman, giving her the necessary medicine and all these things during her, uh, when she's carrying the child in her womb. But the problem is uh, after the child is born, then also the, her health can have certain issues, then they don't take care of it. And only for 40, 50,000 rupees or even less than that, a a person has to take so much of, uh, you know, carrying a child for nine months. Not only that, there has also been cases where uh, the, uh, a, a certain couple from foreign country, they hired a surrogate here. And uh, meanwhile, in this nine month period, gestation period, they got divorced and no one was there to claim the child. Since it was a very, uh, you know, there was no regulations for this market. 
So there's no one to carry the child. And uh, now this surrogate who already has children of her own, and she's doing this for money because she it comes from a poor family. She has to take care of the child uh, and bring her, bring the child up. So you can imagine the fate of the child. Maybe the child will be sent off to some home or made a child labor or something because it is not that woman's child, uh, her biological child. So... Uh, so these kind of issues were coming up. That's why we had the Assisted Reproductive Technologies Bill, which banned commercial surrogacy and uh, said that we have only altruistic surrogacy. And now there's a fresh bill which says that there has been various uh, various versions of the bill and the new fresh version, uh, you know, amended version says that there will be only, only married couples, heterosexual couples will have, uh, they can have, children through surrogacy that too if you are childless for five months so all these provisions are there you can go through the provisions uh, in your current affairs so um, now from a sociological angle why we should not have commercial surrogacy what are the problems of commercial surrogacy we'll see and we'll see different sociologists take on it so first is why it is wrong so as per leading feminist Deborah Satz and please quote these names this these actually give you know uh, gravity or weight to your answer in her work why something should not be for sale states that women's surrogacy reinforces negative gender stereotyping by looking at the women as baby machines and there is a landmark American case you can say that Johnson versus Calvert so in this case it was represented there was a societal rep perception of women as a class of breeder so woman she's a, just a baby machine she has no you know she's just like any other machine that just gives some kind of output and there's the case of baby m of new jersey where surrogate mothers are degraded to baby making machines which requires that the surrogate mother deny all her feelings of motherhood and makes her no more than a contract laborer with no emotional legal right over the child now when you are carrying a child in your womb for nine months, it's only natural that you can have some kind of emotional attachment to, to that uh, child in your, to that fetus or the child that is growing up in your womb. But the problem is, uh, uh, as, as, since you are under the contract of surrogacy, you cannot, you know, the moment the child is born, you don't have any attachment. You cannot have any emotional attachment. You are not allowed to see the child. You just, you know, it depends on the couple whether they will allow you or not. The child doesn't even know that you were at you carried the child in your womb. Maybe the child will be taken off some other country by uh, her, by his or her parents. So you're basically a machine. A machine cannot have any kind of, you know, uh, attachment to uh, uh, to its product. So it's actually so uh, so women are made to baby machines. Second, Jenna Correa, in her work, The Mother Machine, opines that surrogacy is a part of patriarchal conspiracy to control women's bodies and reproduction. So in a feminist opinion says that uh, since women have the, you know, uh, uh, women give birth to babies. So it's just like, uh, you know, you are trying to control a woman's body. Uh, the, because just because she can reproduce, you're trying to control and keeping her into this push, pushing her into this, this kind of work so that she cannot be your competitor in the labor force. Is it clear? You, she cannot join someone who is a surrogate for nine months. It's actually, uh, she is engaged there and that too, she is meagerly paid. She cannot join the labor force or compete in other spheres. So that is actually a patriarchal conspiracy. That's what feminist thinkers say, that it's a patriarchal conspiracy of keeping her confined within her, you know, household and the reproductive action, you know, kind of reinforcing or kind of re-glorifying her work as a, as a reproductive machine and not letting her venture into other fields. Next, Barbara Rothman says that it is a modern form of slavery and class oppression because these South Asian countries where which are very poor or these African countries, black women, they, they serve as surrogates because there is poverty and, you know, these people, there is gender discrimination, uh, people are, they cannot fend for their families. So they are ready to become, they become easy surrogates just for money. I, as I said, that only for 20, 30,000 rupees, they are ready to carry the 
maybe they are in debts maybe the husband is a farmer and there's a crop failure so the woman is left with nothing but she is acting as a surrogate it reinforces patriarchy so again a mother has no control over the child someone who is carrying the child in her womb has no emotional attachment to her so it actually reinforces patriarchy so only the father uh, the biological father his lineage that is important the the child is born to the father uh, and his lineage can be traced through the child but someone who is carrying her in the womb so actually you're denigrating a woman because someone who is carrying the work of of do, having doing the work of uh, carrying her in your in her womb has no uh, has no role or no part or her efforts are not valued so that is in one way is reinforcing patriarchy also uh, religious groups have called them mechanical adultery adultery is when you are unfaithful so this is mechanically done it's not that you are totally being adulterous but it's mechanical adultery now uh so that is why commercial surrogacy has been banned now he, another angle is when you are having this bill so when you are told to uh, say you have a question on sociological impact of the art bill or you know uh, the implications of the art bill so art bill will actually stop these things like modern slavery or you know reinforcing patriarchy or commodification of women as baby producing machines but on the flip side the art bill is restricted to only heterosexual couples so actually when you have if you see this data india has single household person so so and so uh, 75% of all households are lone parent families so if you don't uh, allow uh, uh, you you are denying rights to these people to have children uh you know a lone parent cannot have a, you know a child through biological means so if he takes by a surrogate through ivf he or she then you are not allowing that so you are actually uh being very restrictive in your in your or uh, sometimes you have single mothers there's an increase in divorce rates or uh, all these things so there's an increase in single parent households there are various other social factors uh, due to which there's an increase in single parent households or you know live in couples so you are actually uh, you know on one hand you are looking for uh, speaking of rights of marginalized and there are lgbtq queer communities so these people you are you are giving them rights but they don't have the right to parenthood so you are actually going back so this is one counter agreement that these parent people are deprived of their rights to have a child so in that way you can say that this is you know this is actually um, satisfying the functional definition of family uh if you go for murdoch murdoch is a functionalist he gives a functional definition of family that family is supposed to uh, satisfy is what is the role of a family uh, uh economic needs sexual needs biological you know uh, for the process of progeny and for socializing so only a heterosexual family uh you know uh so can satisfy all these roles so this is that is the standard family but uh, you if you study uh, families among different communities for example catherine gog studied uh, family among these uh, you know the naya tribes where um, uh, these people uh, like they uh, the woman is married and she stays back in her brother's house and they have visiting husbands so these are also families and we cannot go by the functional definition or a standard definition of family for example you know these uh, uh, the the kind of family that is showed on your uh, you know on your serial packets or you know you have these uh, like father mother two children a proper heterosexual family so this bill only caters to that category of people what about the marginalized what about disintegrated households what about reconstituted families they are not uh, you know they are left out of the purview so you can write it as a counter agreement to the art bill is it clear is it clear guys yes any doubts you have any doubts in this topic any doubts 
Any doubts? You can write no if you don't have any doubts because this is the last topic. Today we had only three topics. Um, so we'll wrap up. Because if sessions are too long, then people lose interest. They leave midway. So we are keeping short sessions, only one hour. That, that is the scheduled time, the stipulated time that is mentioned. And we, uh, I've, I've designed it in such a way that it, it will be within one hour. Last two sessions were very big. So. <laughs> Hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, I would like to, uh, actually, I'm asking this question because I'm, I have attend. I am attending the first session. Yes, and yes. I don't know how all of this uh, thing is going on. So, if briefly, could you uh, let me know about all of these sessions and all this program that will be very much helpful. Like See, we have we session one and we have session one and two on YouTube. I would request you to go through those sessions on the Diademy IS channel. Then you can understand that how we, this is the third session, how it has started. It's basically, the need for current affairs is when you are addressing, if you if you see your uh, previous year questions, your section B part of your Indian uh, society, paper two, that is very, very dynamic. And there you have to write from a sociological perspective. So that is where your current affairs needs handy because you have to substantiate, you cannot write just general statements. You have to substantiate it with studies or, you know, views of just like I gave these views, no? like, you know, uh, a child producing machine. So uh, Deborah Sat says this uh, child producing machine or, you know, uh, uh, Barbara Rothman says that it's a new kind of slavery. You cannot just like that, right? So if you write these uh, studies or these, uh, you know, findings or some data, some examples, for example, the uh, example that I gave on caste and how you can use it. So uh, for that, we are having these sessions. And if you are a beginner, uh, are you a beginner? Uh, like you've, you've started, just started st st studying sociology for UPSC, couple? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So if initially you might find that this is uh, like you cannot understand what it is. So for that, we are having found, we'll be having foundation lectures, you know, we, where we'll start from scratch, like from just the basics and we'll be having it every month. So we'll be having current affairs and foundation lectures and we'll be starting it very soon we'll have a few of them on youtube also uh, so ma'am in last two lectures you have covered uh, the current affairs part so i want to ask that whether i need to focus on newspaper as well for this uh, current affair or you will be covering all of them i will be covering for sociology i can guarantee i'll be covering all of that you don't have to do additional work focus on your prelims and your gs and other part you know sociology will be taken care of sociology current affairs okay. that i can uh, is there any timetable like uh, after seven days gap you will be keeping a session or something like that every saturday we have these sessions yesterday there was some technical problem that's why i, I had it on sunday every saturday 7:30 Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, and you'll get the link in the group. Okay, any other questions? Doubts? Ma'am, ma'am, these sessions are only held on Saturday. Yes, once a week, Saturday. Okay, ma'am. Any other questions, guys? Ma'am, can we get the PPT also? Hmm. We are having right now, uh, we, we, we are posting it on, uh, sorry, we are putting the session on YouTube. So PPT maybe in future, we haven't decided about it. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Any, any other question, doubt, anything regarding the course, this, that, anything? Any, any doubts, guys, or else we'll wrap up. Hope you liked it. Ma'am. Hope you enjoyed. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I'm a beginner. I'm uh, I'm not studying sociology yet. Right. And how can I study ba through basics from, tip, uh, from top? You can study from basics. How you can study from how basics? Can, yes, ma'am. How can I study basics? Okay. Go so through NCRT can, or directly through the books? I would suggest go through NCRT first. 11 and 12 NCRTs. If you, have do, if you don't have, if you've never studied sociology before, 
I would say uh, uh, go for NCRT basics. Okay, ma'am. Then standard books. Yes, standard books. You can also attend our YouTube lectures. We'll, we'll be having it soon where we'll start from scratch. That will make work easier for you. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Also, we are launching a foundation course very soon. So you can join those courses. Some of some of the lectures will be free on YouTube, not all of that. And for the rest, you can join the foundation course. For beginners, absolutely lucid thing. Any other questions, guys? Are these courses free or in future I would pay? I these are founded the foundation course total totally free. No, some of it will be free on YouTube. Ma'am, these current affairs that current affairs as of now, yes, it's on YouTube. It's free. Come on, YouTube is free. We are having it on YouTube. Any other questions, doubts, anything, guys? Then we'll wrap up. I guess no, no questions. So shall we wrap up? Uh, so I one suggestion yes, would be that, yeah, that unless it's very urgent, try to attend the live classes. It gives, uh, you know, a better experience, a better class experience as it is you're sitting at home. And, you know, if you rely on YouTube, you'll watch half of the video and then you'll feel like sleeping off or putting it, pausing it and watching some song or something. So live class, you are having a better engagement. See, through your current affairs, you also got to know about Louis Dumo. So those who are starting and you have, haven't started Louis Dumo would get to know. And those who have studied before and also had a revision of Louis Dumo. So we, there will be tweaking of topics uh, from static with current affairs. So in a way, your static is also getting revised. So please attend live classes. That is one suggestion. Okay, ma'am. Okay, then. And it's only one hour so on Saturdays. Okay. Okay, then. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank See you, you next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh...